my name is Keith Barry. Um, I'm interested, given the, the highly politically charged debate about the NBN, mm -hmm. um, what the implications are for this project if it was not to go ahead. The NBN provides, if you like, the backbone of the network that would be needed to transmit the data. I mean, clearly the NBN's not going to go to the individual dishes. It, the NBN is kind of the, the, the spine, if you like, of the network. Um, could we live without it? Well, we'd have to do something like it. We'd have to build our own private network in some sense if we didn't have the NBN. The NBN is something Australia is doing which is an amazingly impactful on the project. So it certainly attracts the project to Australia because of the existence of the NBN. We would have to do it otherwise if, if the NBN didn't exist. But I think it's a very big advantage for Australia to have a project of that scale. So I'm very supportive of the project going forward. In fact, the very first piece of the NBN has been installed, as well, it's already happened, between Geraldton and Perth. Um, there's a that fibre has been installed, it's actually there and will be operational by the middle of next year. Hi, I'm Cathy. First, I'd like to thank you for your... I'm up here. Oh, <laughs> Hello, for your uh, very good uh, speech and um, you. uh, talk. You were so intelligent, obviously. I admire your intelligence and the way you explained it to us all. I, I think we, it was fabulous. Uh, I'd like to know who is going to make the decision. Is there a judging panel or um, are these... <coughs> Who, who's got the final say? I mean sure, it, it's it's a, it's not like like the Olympic Games or anything. It's it's um, yeah. there is an international body which is in fact just been formed. Um, it has ten countries involved with it right now, and those are the parties which are going to provide the funds. And so there's an international council of the SKA, and it's um, at the moment it's the UK, um, Italy, France, Germany, Netherlands, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, China, and Korea. And th th we expect more countries will join, that all the 20 will eventually join this new council. It is that new council that will, in February next year, make the decision. So right now, <coughs> the council is running a, a site selection process. So in other words, there, there's an independent body which has been set up called a site selection group, which is gathering the data, which is gathering all the information you'd need to make the decision. So you have to understand, is this the best site in the world? How radio quiet is it? How uh, stable is it? What does it cost to erect the telescope there? What's the cost of power? What roads are in place? What people, what industry is in place? What towns are there, schools? The entire spectrum of data that would support the project is being gathered from South Africa and from Australia. And that body of data is going into a submission to the council in September. And then there'll be a process of adjudication which goes from September basically through to the end of this year. And then we expect a formal announcement in February next year. David O'Brien, um, very excited about this proposal. Question in regard to the position of, uh, central position of educational interest for the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. Where are the kids? How, you, how is this um, exciting the youth? They're the ones who are going to take <coughs> this on, yeah? Sure. Um, look, I mean, we're, very, we're really lucky uh, being astronomers. Astronomy is very um, accessible because you see pictures, wonderful pictures of galaxies and stars and the Hubble Space Telescope is still in orbit because people wouldn't let it come down. It was just too much community pressure, right? So um, it's very, so kids get excited about this just like dinosaurs and planets and stars and aliens, you know. It's, it's very easy to excite the kids about astronomy and so that's great. And, and, but they are genuinely excited about the potential of this being their future, okay? Because the kids, who, who are going to be the astronomers using this? The kids in year 10, year 9 now are exactly about the right position to go through the process to be research scientists by the time this is going to be there. So they can see it being important for them, right? At the time they're making decisions about, well, am I going to do physics, am I going to do math, am I going to do chemistry? This is a very important and relevant thing for them right now. Um, plus, it's not just astronomy. It's a huge range of... It's the, it's the fiber optics, the electrical engineering, the digital electronics, the systems engineering, the mechanical engineering, the ICT and software design, the supercomputing. This is a very multifaceted project. And in f to be honest with you, why do we have 10 countries at the table willing, for, willing to put hundreds of millions of euros on the table? It's not, unfortunately, because of the astronomy. It's because of the impact of this project. Okay? This project will produce enormous and measurable industrial impact in the world. It's already attracting the attention of the IBMs and the Googles and the Microsofts of this world. They're really keen. I'm having breakfast with IBM in the morning. I mean, they're, they're, they're dying to know more about this particular project because it will push the boundaries. 
And the kids, the kids know that. They can see that broad spectrum of opportunities. It's not, you don't have to be a geek astronomer, astronomer just to you know, get involved. It's a, it's a pretty impressive ICT project too. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm uh, Richard French. Um, I'd li like to go back to the science of it, if I may, because I don't understand. I, I understand you know the frequency of the radio emission from hi hydrogen. Mm -hmm. By the time it gets here from wherever, yep. it's changed fr frequency. Yep. How do you know it's hi hydrogen? Um, <laughs> yes. Hydrogen basically has um, some unique characteristics in terms of its the shape of the line, okay, the shape of the... the when we receive the information from the sky, we receive it at all different frequencies. And so the hydrogen line has a very particular shape. So we know where hydrogen line when we see it because it's got this really nice shape. It comes from galaxies. So independent pretty much of the frequency where it comes from, it's got a particular shape. So yeah, it's a good question. But we, uh, it, there's a little bit of guesswork sometimes, but most of the time the shape is really a giveaway. Okay. Now a question from upstairs. Up here. Uh, good day. Yep. My name's Matt. Um, um, I have a question um, about the the land use of um, Western Australia, at the moment um, there's a lot of debate about the miners or they bring a lot of economic benefit to the thing. Have, have you considered or is there much competition for the land that you're going to use? I mean, are you building on top of gold deposits and things like that? Has that been thought sure. about? And economic benefits as well. Obviously, mining brings a lot of benefits to sure. Australia. No, um, yeah. Is the, the benefits obviously technologically wise? Sure. But where does no, all that okay. come in play? No, no, very, very good questions. Okay, so I spent most of yesterday in a meeting with the mining industries. Um, I do spend a lot of time in meetings with mining industry. So clearly there are, there are multiple parties interested in using these remote areas in Australia. And they're trying to develop natural resources there which are going to benefit the country. This is, Australia is not unique in this respect. There are other places in the world, like in Chile, where I was. There's enormous open cut copper mines in Chile. There's one 45 kilometres in a straight line from the VLT. Okay? So this open cut copper mine, uh, 24 hours a day operation, so big floodlights, right? So floodlights to flood the whole mine site with light. And of course, the VLT is sitting up there, the world's most sensitive optical telescope, that causes a little bit of a problem, as you can imagine. So the optical astronomers went and visited the miners and said, look, guys, you know, you've got these lights. How about we redesign the top of the light pole so all the light goes down rather than up? Okay, sounds very sensible. So you get more light on the ground and you have less power bills and there's less light going to the sky and we're happy. So, you know, that's may sound like apocryphal example, but it's a true example of the kind of collaboration that goes along around the world between resources and astronomy, between those people who want to use these remote and special places do get together and they do work together. So in the case of the mining industry in Western Australia, there was a railway line and for OH&S reasons, you need to have radio communications to know where the train is and somebody falls off the train or they get sick or whatever it is. So you have to have radio communication. And of course, radio communication in principle interferes with the SKA. So right now, there's a whole bunch of discussions going on between CSIRO, between ICRA and between the mining people, choosing technological solutions for the railway communication system that avoids sending signals into the SKA sensitivity band. So this is entirely possible. This actually can be done. So astronomers and engineers and mining companies are working together right now to make sure we can have a coexistence in that region. So this is going on and it's actually, I think, being very successful. I think Australia is demonstrating it's got a dialogue going on between the development organisations and the astronomy organisation. So I, I personally don't think this is going to be a problem. I think it's actually a success story because you can imagine if the mine's building a power station or if the mine needs a fibre optic connection, great, because we can provide that, right? So there's synergies here that can be actually exploited. In terms of the land itself, of course, we have the Aboriginal people and there are land claims all over this region. So we have already an Indigenous land use agreement with the Wadjuri Yamaji people over the core of this place. And that's both communities are benefiting. That was a very rapidly evolved uh, Illawa because we're not digging big holes in the ground and things. So our land footprint is actually quite gentle. So we've actually got a good working relationship with the indigenous people in the region. Finally, the question about economic benefit. This facility will cost about $3 billion to build. The operational cost of a facility like that is around about 150 million euros per annum. Half, two thirds of that income will come into Western or into Australia, okay? Because we are the host country, so the, there is an enormous, there's a tangible economic benefit. And over a 50-year lifetime, the operational cost exceeds the capital cost. 
Right? So there is tr there's job creation, there is income into the country because we are hosting this facility. That's in addition to, of course, all the other things are the jobs that are created to build the telescope, to operate the telescope, the, all the other spin-offs in terms of industry initiatives, etc. So I think there's very much a tangible benefit. Uh, Millicent Hughes, my um, question is about cooperation. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that South Africa and Australia are the two main competi competitors in this Correct. event. Is there a possibility that there could be a cooperative venture between these two countries in this project? Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, again, as I said, I think before that the, this is not just about South Africa and Australia. It's about the 20 countries who want to build this facility. And so in the end of the day, if, if Australia doesn't win it, Australia is still going to be part of the project and South Africa likewise, I hope. So we're all part of this venture to build this thing. The question is, if you're going to spend $3 billion, you have to put the telescope in a place where it's going to achieve its scientific mission. Okay. The, the two sites are not the same. It's not like one is, you know, you flick a, flick a coin. They are quite different in their aspects. And so when you, I think, look at it in the light of day and say, where is the best environment to put this in terms of the amount of land, the radio quietness, and all the other aspects we have to consider, I believe that Australia and New Zealand offer the best home. Now, it doesn't mean South Africa loses at all because they're part of this global adventure to build this and they can be a huge player in all the other aspects of the telescope project. In the ICT, there's as much money in the ICT as there is in these dishes. Okay? So there's lots of global opportunity to benefit from this project. It's not that in some sense the physical location of it is only part of the story. Okay. And we are already collaborating. We have a great scientific collaboration with South Africa. We have a lot of South African scientists going backwards and forwards from West Australia to South Africa. Uh, we are uh, collaborating on the scientific. These pathfinders, you saw the Australian SKA pathfinder. The Southern Africans have built a pathfinder as well called Meerkat. Um, <laughs> CAT is the Karoo Aperture Telescope, Karoo Array Telescope, KAT, and Meerkat is a bigger version of that. So, um, so they've got Meerkat and we've got ASCAP. Completely complementary telescopes. So together we're designing scientific surveys of the sky that use both telescopes. So you know, I think scientifically the, we're collaborating quite well. Unfortunately, as I said, you know, we, when we're investing $3 billion, you better make sure you put the thing where it's going to do the job. This maximum discovery sort of lo logo is really important because you, know, you want to get the most out of this investment for mankind and putting it where it's going to do the best job. Oh, hi. Yeah, my name's Ali. Yeah, look, you've mentioned the mining sector and mm -hmm. natural resources mm -hmm. development, so I guess I'd just like to chuck another one in there. Sure. So I was thinking this was, I was feeling pretty enthusiastic about this till I saw this last slide. Yep. And you happened to say that that's how you want the Western Australian desert to look. Yep. Well, I'm an arid zone ecologist. Yep. And that's not actually what I want the desert to look like. So, oh. I mean, but obviously, you know, it's a matter of scale. Yeah. So I'm interested also in the environmental impacts of... Sure of the project and has there had to be an environmental impact statement or Ab something like absolutely, that? So yeah. that's sort of the first part of my question. Yep. The second part is in these quantities of data. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's pretty staggering. It you is. know, the same yeah. amount of information in one day as is currently generated in a whole year. And I guess we've all probably seen or known of projects where lots of data has been collected, but then, well, how do you manage that data? Yeah, sure. What's the capability going to be like to process and do something constructive with that mind-bogglingly large amount of information, which sure. is suddenly going to go up. Yep. Very good questions. Very good questions. Thanks. So, if, if, as far as the first part's concerned, the environmental impact. Yes, we had to go through a complete environmental study for the as for the ASCAP for the Pathfinder. So we did all of the sort of impact statements and things like that, and it passed them because, as I said, it's a it's a fairly gentle impact on the environment. We don't have to to do a lot of excavation and the pads that these things go on are fairly light and they're about five metres by five metres. So, you know, we're not um, that disruptive on the landscape. Um, we are working very uh, actively with a company called Horizon Power to develop uh, geothermal and solar power systems for these telescopes. So in other words, we hope to be able to have a completely renewable energy approach um, to powering the telescopes. And we, in fact, we've just received a grant from the federal government, $47 million, to develop a one megawatt class green energy station for the ASCAP. If that's successful, then we can roll that green power system out into 
regional communities. We can also use it to power all the hubs of the SKA. So we're trying to be um, very conscious of the footprint, both physically and environmentally, of the telescope uh, as well. And uh, you know, as we're, we're also keeping on the rural properties where these telescopes are. So we're keeping the rural management in place, both the indigenous and the local. So there are people there who know the land, who understand how to manage the land, and uh, we can keep that knowledge in place. Um, as far as the data is concerned, this is something that's very near and dear to my heart, being a computer kind of geeky kind of person. Um, there's a change, we have to have a change in a number of paradigms, a number of sort of areas of computing. Um, let me talk about a few of them. The first one is, I think that people have thought in the past about um, telescopes and data, that you take a bunch of data over here, a telescope and you put it on some disk drives or some tapes or whatever, you take it away and you put it into some big computer and it crunches and it gives you out some numbers and some images and what have you, and you can sort of scratch your head and think about it and that's really good. That's gone. That sort of model of doing science is completely gone. What has to happen now is that the data from the telescope effectively never touches the ground. That we, have, we cannot possibly store that data. We cannot possibly tr even transmit the data very far. We have to have high performance computing, the world's biggest computer system sitting right at the back of the telescope, right there in the line of the data flow to analyze pretty much in real time the data that's coming in and by doing this analysis compress the amount of data into manageable volumes. Okay? So it's, there's a marriage now. So people used to think of supercomputers as sort of, you know, machines that live in very special buildings and you, you apply for time on them and you send jobs there and the jobs come back. A very uh, asynchronous, a very offline kind of mode. With the SKA, supercomputing, ultra computing, becomes part of the telescope. So it's a different paradigm for the way computing has to work in doing science. And that's now happening. Um, the other thing is the data flow itself, moving data from A to B. One of the biggest problems we have right now is I, super, computers are getting fast enough. So if you plot the speed of a computer versus time, it luckily gets to the right place at the right time for SKA. If you plot the, the capacity of disk drives, they also get to the right place at the right time. So I'm not worried too much about the bytes and the flops, the power and the capacity. What really worries me is the rate of sending data, the I.O., how fast you can move data from one place to another. We know that's not getting faster. We know that we can't move data fast enough for the SKA. So we're going to have to invent a whole new data transport system to deal with the data flow from the SKA. And that big research project is one that's just really exciting. A lot of people in the world like Cisco and Google and IBM because exactly the same problem needs to be solved if we want to transmit um, real-time video, real-time animation, medical imagery three-dimensional holographic medical imagery around the planet. This is a common problem of moving extremely large amounts of data over some distance. And so there's a research project. We have to do research to solve that. Probably the largest problem of the ICT has nothing to do at all with the data or the I.O. or the flops or the bytes. It's to do with the kilowatts. Okay, so right now, supercomputers absorb enormous amounts of kilowatts. If you figure out from today's standards how much energy you would need to run the supercomputer for the SKA, you'd need a power station for 100 megawatts. Right? So 100 megawatts just to run the computer. Um, that would gobble up the entire capital budget of the SKA in three years. Okay? So we need to improve the power efficiency of computers by at least a factor of 10. Okay? We need to get the watts down for the flops. Again, that's called green supercomputing, and, and all the whole world's interested in it because it's driving all the costs of computing. And the thing that's actually helping us most of all here, believe it or not, is video games. Okay? Video games. So these guys here, this has a graphics computer in it, which is extremely low power. It's, why is it low power? Because it has to fit in one of these thin little guys here and absorb basically no power. These graphics computers that are sitting in here and driving the screen you can see up here, are actually very powerful supercomputers. And so what we're trying to do now is harness this wave of innovation in graphics computing to solve the computing problem in the SKA. Not because the flops, because of the watts, because they produce, these guys here per, per flop are about one-tenth the power of a supercomputer. Okay? So you can see the synergies that are developing between various kinds of technologies. So I'm not pretending all the problems are solved. There are big research problems that need to be solved, but everybody's interested in this. It's really a global problem we have to solve. Good evening, thank you. I'm Ross Lee. 
the opening presentation you gave about the benefits of dilating the pupil mm -hmm. and then the subsequent explanations of your uh, square kilometre array are all on the input side. Mm -hmm. Is there any progress on in terms of the detector, if you like, the retina? Mm -hmm. Are we as far as we've got in the detection of photons incoming within the bands we're interested in? Sure. Or is there some research on that side as well? Yeah. There's a lot of research on that side. In fact, I didn't go into that in any detail because what it's again a research project which is going on right now. So, um, for example, with the Australian SKA Pathfinder, normally with a radio telescope, there's one sensitive retina, one sensitive light, sensitive cell, single pixel, if you like, in the camera. What the ASCAP, what the Australian SKA Pathfinder is doing is actually inventing a digital radio camera. So instead of having a single sensitive spot for radio waves, we've got actually a pixels, like n pixels by m pixels, like, a, like a, it's a radio version of a digital camera. So that technology has been invented and developed right now by CSIRO here in Australia for ASCAP. So there's a lot of work going on in that space. The reason why is because clearly if you've got more sensitive elements, you can see more of the sky, right? So it's a, it's a huge area of research going on. Um, I'm up here. Yep. Um, name's Matt. Um, I'm okay. just wondering, with all of the uh, development that's being done by the CSIRO and you mentioned the power challenge, mm -hmm. how much of the project do you think will be built by Australian companies? Good question. Um, what, hap what is happening right now um, is that in the next four years, so from 2012 through 2015, there is the final design phase, the detailed design phase of the SKA. Now at the back end of that comes the beginning of construction. So during that four year period, 2012 through 2015, the tenders are going to go out and the construction project will be beginning. Who will do the detailed design is going to be international consortia. So all the nations which are <coughs> part of the SKA will be encouraged to form consortia universities, industries, international corporate bodies, these consortia will sign up to bid effectively for the work inside this design phase of the SKA. So there's about 10 or 12 individual areas. It's called the um, Project execu Execution Plan, which has now been finalised by this international committee. Um, so there's about 10 or 12 areas of work. And so Australia right now is partnering up uh, with international organizations and industries to bid for the work of this uh, PEP program basically. So that's going to set the industries that are engaged. Now there is no um, hard and fast rules about who can be in a consortium. There's no hard and fast rules about how big they can be or who's going to get what salt slice <coughs> of the pie. The project wants to choose the best consortia for the job. Right? Now you have to understand in these big international projects there's always a principle called just retour, which means that if you put a dollar in, you expect to get a dollar back in terms of return to you. And that's fair enough. I think most countries who invest in these big projects expect to get some return for their investment in proportion to that investment. In general, that seems to work out because the bigger countries tend to put more money in and they get more of the slice of the pie. So it's, it's I think in the end of the day, it works out in general that the best consortia win the work to be done. And those consortia can be big companies, little companies, all joined together in one consortium. I think Australia is, at the moment, putting in a very significant amount of money into this project. Okay? In Rome in April, 2nd of April, when this international body was formed with the 10 countries, those countries that wished to be considered for the site were asked to put in what was called a site premium. Okay, so in other words, your share of this project, like Australia is a relatively small population-wise and uh, et cetera, economy-wise compared to, say, Europe and the United States, but we were asked to put in more than our fair share of the project to be able to qualify, if you like, as a valid candidate for the site. So, in fact, Australia put 20% of the money on the table for this uh, four-year study. Right? So, I think a 20% kind of involvement is the minimum which we can expect. Oh, hi, <coughs> my name's Robert Hart. I was interested in what plans are in place for community engagement, say mm -hmm. amateur astronomers, open source mm -hmm. communities, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Sure. Um, 
we are very we take very seriously our, our commitment our obligation to communicate here I am tonight um, and we're in the middle of a very big campaign in Australia to try to bring particularly this year of the decision year the SKA to the community I think there is something like 300 events uh, being uh, held in the next few months in Australia all over Australia to educate our community about this project so we're trying very hard to get the message out that this is an exciting project as far as engagement and involvement, um, there is a number of citizen science-like projects being launched. So citizen science means there is a way that you could use your computer at home to download some SKA data and do something to it and help the scientists do their job. Just painting a broad picture, but that's more or less what's going to happen in, in, in June this year. We're going to launch uh, one of the first of these citizen science projects uh, called the Skynet, and you'll be able to participate in analyzing radio astronomy data. So stay tuned. down here. <laughs> Anyone out there? <laughs> um, it's been very interesting to learn the, the um, motivation for government and business to be interested yes. in this. Um, if it's not a stupid question, what are the, the big questions that science is being motivated by sure. um, other than, than just pure science? Yeah, look, um, the SKA was designed to purpose. It's, it's been designed to attack four or five key science questions. Okay, I've already talked about a couple of them. So finding the edge, finding the first light, you know, getting back to the very beginning, page one, chapter one, cosmic story. That's one of the big ones, right? SK will do that. SK also is this huge panoramic wide fish angle lens for looking at the universe. So it's gonna build catalogs of billions and billions of galaxies. So our ability to understand the diversity and complexity of the universe in terms of its population uh, will grow by a factor of a thousand times as much as what we have right now. That's an, another key science case. Looking for planets, because of the high resolution you can get with the SKA, because it's so big, you can see, just like peering into the middle of the galaxy with the little R2-D2s, the SKA is you know, 3,000 kilometers across, it can see incredibly fine detail around stars. Look for planets is another way that the SKA is doing. One which is not talked about very much, but and most, most astronomers sort of shy away from, from some strange reason, uh, is the ET issue, okay? The SKA is gonna be the world's best ET trap, okay? It will, we will, um, if there is a planet out there around a star um, that has, say, airport radar, right? If that star is 100 light years from us, we can look at their airport radar, okay? So it's pretty impressive. So we can, you know, we'll be listening to ET phoning around the place, all over the place. But, but it's, it's a, an incredibly important machine, I think, for this ET search issue. You know, if there are really signs of extraterrestrial intelligence in the local galaxy, I'm not talking about the universe in general, I'm talking about our own home galaxy still, but in, in the reasonable neighborhood of our own home galaxy, then we'll be able to find them. And that's really exciting. And one from up in the gallery, yes. Perhaps a minor question. Uh, can you, would you like to speculate at all what getting back to first light is going to tell us? I think it's, you know, the analogy with the book is quite a good one. You can imagine, as I said, reading a, a story or reading a book in which you only have the last sort of two thirds of the story or something. You'd love to know how it all began, particularly some of the complicated stories. So um, it, we'd like to see how this all began. What were the first objects to form? Were they big? Were they little? Were they hot? Were they cold? Were they normal stars? Were they whole clumps of stars? You know, what, was the, what were the seeds? What seeds made the structure we see today? How did it begin? And if we understand how it began, how the seeds formed, then we can understand you know, the whole evolution of structure in the universe. So this, you know, this first step in creation, if you like, the first objects being formed, um, that's a very complicated and hidden and distant process for us. And that's truly exciting to see that because that will really give us a great foothold, if you like, on understanding the whole history of the universe. And another one from down on the floor. Hi, I'm Holly Cartwright. Um, just a simple question for you. How, when it's built and working, how soon do you think we will get results that would tell us sure. anything? Sure. One of the really nice things about the SKA, um, which is kind of different from the optical telescopes, is that it, you can use it as it gets bigger. In other words, if, you, if you're building the big optical telescopes like the VLT, 
you have to build the big mirror and you have to put the big mirror in the telescope and you have to do a whole, before you can use it, right? With the SKA, if you build 1%, 10%, 50%, 100% of the dishes, all the way along that path, you can use it to do science, okay? So it's, it's a great machine because, so we can start really, really early, okay? So if we start construction in 2016 of the 10%, the idea is we start in 2016 and build 10% of it. That'll go to about 2019. So I would say before 2019, we'll be using the 5% or the 2%, right? So you know, we'll use it as we build it. And uh, maybe a final question from down here. Sure. Thank you. Um, Keith Potts. I was with the minerals industry yesterday as well. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that came across quite clearly was the change in technology over time. Mm -hmm. um, they talked about using the original Landsat for mineral exploration mm -hmm. and how unuseful it is now mm -hmm. in terms of increased bandwidth, increased resolution within that bandwidth. Mm -hmm. So the question about this really is, are you confident of the design? Um, what would happen if you only got 80% of the distance back to the first light? And is there actually an upgrade path for something, or is it set in stone, effectively? Yeah, um, good question. Um, look, I mean, I've, I've got to be honest with you. We, we think we know where first light is, right? We could be horribly surprised, uh, but we think we know where it is. Um, one of the nice things about the SKA, and, and it's, you know, this incredible monster machine, it's pretty simple, okay? Dishes, you know, chicken wire and you know, sticks and, uh, it, 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 it's easy to build more dishes in some sense, and it's also easy to replace the detectors and upgrade the system. As to, there's a lot of old radio telescopes in the world. Parks, for example, built in the 1950s. It's still a forefront radio astronomy facility, right? So by upgrading the electronics, by upgrading the detectors, by upgrading the software, you can actually improve the performance. So I'm not too worried about building it wrongly. I think we build it with a particular design goal in mind. And I think we'll be, I don't think this will be, you know, we're not going to miss by a long shot, okay? In fact, I think we'll be surprised and find something we didn't expect at all, which is even better. Well, somebody said, you know, if, if, if um, what, what would you be, what would you really love the SKA to find? And I said, the things we don't know about. That's the most important. And on that note, if there are no further questions, we might, I might ask you to put your hands together now and thank Professor Peter Quinn for a fantastic presentation.